So uh, I started teaching in 2004. How many people were teaching in 2004? So quite a few. And I just want to say that was a great time to profess, right? <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't just like, uh, we weren't cognitive coaches yet. We were professing, and it was a great time to profess because they couldn't get anything uh, like we were teaching anywhere else. It was very difficult. They'd have to go to the library and do some digging. And this is my room back in 2004, and you can see uh, the only uh, real technology in there is that, that big light up at the top. And I controlled that light. You know, I controlled the screen. And so I was the most interesting thing in the room. So that's 2004. Fast, flash forward to 2017, and you can see this is the same room. They actually redesigned it. Uh, it's quite fancy here. Uh, this is me over here on the right, and you can see everybody's a little closer to me. It's a nice redesign. Uh, but there's something very profoundly different about this room from 2004, and that is Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is bringing in all this other content that actually competes with me, both in terms of its uh, ability to distract my students, but also in its ability to teach my students. So I teach uh, anthropology, which is like the study of all humans in all times, all places. And essentially, it's the story of us. And I chose 2017 as the date that changed my life because that's the year Morgan Freeman came out with a Netflix special called The Story of Us. And I just could not compete with Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and so I remember seeing The Story of Us and being like, man, this is so much better than my class. My students could just sit on Netflix and watch this. And I just like, at the same time, was asked to go teach online myself because we were facing budget cuts and the university was changing. So I came to my classroom just looking at this webcam like this, and, uh, and I literally just, just collapsed. I, I went to the floor of my room, <laughs> and this is, this is me on the floor, and I just laid there thinking, like, gosh, my, my career is over. Like, everything I love about teaching is gone. I, I, I don't have that, that face-to-face energy anymore. Uh, Morgan Freeman is so much better than me. Um, and I went ahead and I recorded my first lecture. This is the graph of, of attention to my first lecture. And you can see it starts off pretty good, but by two minutes, there's this collapse. And what's happened here is, for the first two minutes, it's basically a bunch of clips that I threw together with a voiceover, um, and not my voiceover, it's, it's other interesting people talking. It's kind of like a mashup. It's, it's like, I call it like a hype piece. And students love that part. And then I start talking, and you can see, as soon as I start talking, the, <laughs> it just plummets. And uh, I stopped the, the, the clip at one point, this is me literally saying I'm super excited. And you can see I don't look excited at all. And just seeing myself on camera uh, put me back on the floor again. And I spent a lot of time on the floor in the last six years <laughs> trying to adapt. And all the while I'm sitting there, you know, and like thinking about Morgan Freeman, you know. <laughs> he's, he's so charismatic and so much better than me at, at what I'm supposed to be doing. So I had this idea that I would beat Morgan Freeman. You know, I, I would get really good at video editing and making videos and make these amazing videos. So I had this idea that I would tell the, the story of human history uh, by going out into the world and making this great video. I was going to use this big hill that's right by campus, go down the hill, and then down at the bottom, turn to basically mimic this graph. And I was going to lecture as I was going, talking about the, the pace of change and how it's getting uh, faster and faster and then go through that. And so this is what that video looks like. You can see. City's starting to grow. Halfway down, the lecture was completely falling apart. You'll notice. But I was determined to try to save it. Right, to New Zealand years ago. And as we hit the New Zealand, as we hit the quarry part of history, the population explodes. So, so uh, that, I was back on the floor again, contemplating my career choices. And then 2020 hit, and you know my class looked like this. Uh, again, not very inspiring. I wasn't getting that energy that I used to feel in the classroom. So I'm back on the floor again. And then we come back into the classroom, and I thought, finally, you know, like everything will be like it used to be. And of course, it wasn't. 
Uh, if you follow the news, uh, Inside Higher Ed uh, calls it an epidemic of student disengagement. The Chronicle of Higher Education calls it a stunning level of student disconnection. Uh, there was something profoundly wrong as we came back. I don't know if you could feel it, but I could certainly feel it back in the States. Um, and essentially what we were finding was that students were more anxious, overwhelmed, disengaged, disconnected, and behind. And many of us were feeling the same way. And I had this uh, dream, actually, as I was preparing for this talk. Uh, there was actually like a lot of anxiety preparing for this talk because, uh, you know, I was imagining exactly this, like all the, this room of outstanding educators who really care about what they do, and it's, just, it's such an honor to, to be here and to do this, but, you know, like, what do I know <laughs> about teaching right now? Like, teaching's a mess. It's so hard to get it just right, and so I was, I was thinking about, what am I going to say, what am I going to say, and I had this dream, uh, and in the dream, I was dreaming, <laughs> and, and I was dreaming of this moment, and I didn't have anything to say. It's just like the classic, you know, showing up and not having your clothes on kind of thing, but in this case, I just, I didn't have a presentation to give you. And then I woke up in a panic, and this is still in the dream, so I'm, now I'm, I'm watching myself wake up, and this wind came across my face as I, I sat up in bed, and I saw myself like turn to sand and just blow away in the wind. This is kind of cheesy and cliche, but it's a dream, so I didn't really control it. Uh, and it, I, I just heard the wind say, the winds of change, and I was just gone. Um, and that's just kind of how I, I, I felt, you know, like I was just, just disappeared. Um, and so I started uh, thinking about this moment from an anthropological perspective. You know, in anthropology, we have this idea about culture, that culture uh, is the, the webs of significance that we ourselves have spun. And we might have spun them differently. This is one of the key things we try to uh, teach in anthropology is that, you know, things might have been different. Our culture might have been different. If you'd been born somewhere else, your life would be very different. And the reality is that we can and will reweave the web. Every generation reweaves it just a little bit. Some strands don't fit together anymore and they reweave it into something new. Um, to spin or not to spin these webs is not a choice. We are all culture weavers. We all contribute to this in some way. But the webs are fraying, especially post-COVID, and people are losing their sense of meaning and significance. So teaching at its base is really the art of preserving and passing on the most important strands in the web and preparing the next generation to continue weaving and reweaving the web into the future. To me, this is, when you look at teaching in this way, this is, uh, I think, the space where we can find the answers of how to move forward. This is what I th think of as a great thing. It's an idea from Parker Palmer, who took it from Rene Rilke, and it's this idea where, where you're going to look at your discipline or whatever it is you're doing in the way that it has existed throughout all time. Essentially, it's, it's the essence or, of a practice or a discipline. It's the conversations that have been happening around campfires for thousands of years and have emerged and become the disciplines that we teach today. They're full of eternal and essential human questions and concerns, uh, to which every answer just offers more essential questions and concerns. And it's this space that I try to get into when I'm laying there on the floor. I'm contemplating the great thing, like what is it I'm really up to here? Uh, at its most essential um, way of thinking about it, right? And, and I'm trying to connect with that, that conversation that's, that's been going on for thousands of years about the human condition and about teaching. And I, I want to pitch to you that when you get into that space, I'm not saying that it'll like give you like the answer, but it, it does like shine a light on, the, on, a, on a way forward, and it puts you in connection in a way that uh, maybe the answer doesn't even matter so much because you just, you just feel like th this is where you want to be and this is what you want to do. So I want to take us all on a journey to what I'll call great teaching here. But here I mean uh, great teaching that's connected to the great thing of our disciplines. And so uh, what I'll ask you to do first is just try to remember your first encounter with greatness. And for me, that was actually in this very classroom because the place where I teach from today uh, is actually the place where I sat as a student. 
many years ago because I actually get to teach in the same room where I was originally lit up. Uh, I went to Kansas State University as a student and just by uh, extra extraordinary luck, I got to come back and teach at Kansas State University. And so the very spot where I teach is the same spot where I was lit up. And I was lit up by a professor who came up and just professed. He just like um, talked. But he was clearly in touch with the great thing. He wasn't teaching us the answers. He was showing us the great questions and inviting us in to those great questions. And I just was completely absorbed with this. Um, I, I went to him as he was telling us about these, these people in New Guinea, and I was like, oh, I have to know more about this. Like, tell me, tell me more. Uh, you know, I, need, I need to know the answer to these big questions that I have. And he just handed me this book. Uh, this is a Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth. That was an interesting choice because this was another encounter with greatness that I'd had when I was a little kid that book came out and my dad bought the audio book and we used to drive around on car trips and we would listen to this and this is just mind blowing to me. All religions are true for their time. If you can find what the truth is. And it was Joseph Campbell's ideas that originally had me asking all these big questions about who we are and how others have made the passage and how I can make the path. And, and also what the beauties are of the way. Once this catches you, there is always such a feeling from one or another of these traditions of information of a deep, rich, life-vivifying sort. I don't believe in um, being interested in subjects because they're said to be important and interesting. I believe in being caught by it somehow or other. So that's where my questions took me, ultimately. And I uh, was sitting there in the airplane, not knowing any of the language, not knowing any of the people on the other side of the glass. There's no, um, no money, uh, there's no electricity, no running water, and I'm just gonna go out there and I'm just gonna try to meet people and get to know them so that I can maybe find some answers to these big questions. It was then that I realized just how powerful questions can be. Like, they can definitely, like, take you farther than you ever thought possible. And so I just started kind of settling into village life, and uh, this is, they, they kind of adopted me into a family. This is my father here in sitting with his uh, sweet potatoes and bananas there in the background. This is like a big feast in the village. Uh, they eat uh, all kinds of things, uh, spiders, snakes. Uh, snakes are a good deal because it's kind of like a two-for-one thing. You can cut open the snake and you get whatever the snake just ate as the appetizer. Uh, and th that night, I'd, I'd been there about a week when we ate that snake. Uh, and uh, I didn't, you know, I just barely spoke any of the language at all at this point. And um, I'm, uh, we, they found the snake like just maybe 100, uh, 100 meters from where we were staying there. And so I'm thinking, gosh, like a snake like that could crawl into this hut at any time because there's holes in the hut everywhere. And so that night I wrapped myself up in my sleeping bag extra tight uh, and I just cover everything, cover my head and everything. And, uh, but it's the tropics, so the sleeping bag came off of me in the middle of the night and I woke up and I could feel this thing laying across my chest. It was like this big around. And I managed to grab it with my left hand and I threw it off of me. But as I threw it, I rolled with it. So I, I know I'm wrapped up with this thing somehow. But I managed to pin it down with my left hand. And then I try to free my right arm so I can pin it down with two hands and I, I can't move my right arm. And so at this point, I realize I've actually pinned down my own right arm like this. And, and uh, it turns out there was no snake. My, my arm had just fallen asleep and was across me like this. Uh, so I was just wrestling with myself in the dark. And uh, th there's lots of like crazy stories I could tell you about the first few months that I was there. Uh, and they, they can all sound really funny, but in reality, like, it was a really, really hard time because I didn't speak the language and I, I, I couldn't really connect with anybody. It was extreme uh, culture shock and, and fear and anxiety and all these things uh, that I was struggling with. Um, but luckily, I did have one thing in my bag that kind of saved me, and that was this little Aerobe flying ring. It's just a little Frisbee. And I could take this out anywhere and just start a game. And it didn't matter that I didn't speak the language because I could still make friends. And I started making friends in every little village that I went to. 
Uh, and eventually I met my best friend, Lazarus, and we were like soulmates. He wanted to learn English and I wanted to learn his language. Uh, I joined his soccer team and we became inseparable. He ended up taking me back to his home village, which was everything that I ever wanted. It was very remote, so I knew I'd be in touch with some of the great myths and rituals that I wanted to explore. Uh, they live completely off the land, and uh, they just uh, gather sweet potatoes from the garden, and then we sit around the fire and talk. They make these string bags that can carry humans. Uh, they, they cook everything just right in, in the fire. And they have these great click handshakes. Hey, brother. <laughs> no. <laughs> And this is them in the, in the working in the garden here. <laughs> and then and everybody finishes work by early afternoon and they just play all, all afternoon and into the evening, which is obviously one of my favorite things to do as well. And then right before uh, nightfall, we could go to the river and bathe together. Uh, they have all these amazing animals, uh, animals like I'd never seen before. It was like a totally different world. This bird could actually speak the language better than I could when I first got there. And then the, at night, these giant flying foxes come out. It's just a really kind of a magical land. And nighttime is astonishing. So I, was, I spent most of my 20s there. Uh, my wife came to live with me there as well, and she actually... Um, caught the baby of our best friend Melina here, and they let uh, Sarah name the baby, so it was named after uh, Sarah's dad, David. And I watched my best friends, Lazarus and Penny, like my brothers, become fathers. And uh, the more I watched them become fathers, the more I wanted to become a father. And so then when we left, uh, after many, many years uh, throughout our 20s, we finally left and I remember seeing Lanson on the airstrip uh, as I was leaving. And uh, just keep an eye on Lanson, I'll come back to him. So then I come back to the classroom and I'm back in the place where I was originally ignited, the, the big questions that had spurred me on to go out into the world. And I wondered, you know, when I was teaching, am I igniting the same kind of questions that will take people around the world? So I, Halfway through the semester, my first semester of teaching, I just listened to the questions. And the questions were things like, how many points is this worth? How long does this paper need to be? What do we need to know for this test? <laughs> these are terrible questions. You know, these are not going to take them around the world. Uh, and you know, I, I realized that, that I didn't really care about this test. I didn't want them caring so much about this test. I wanted them thinking about this test, like the test of our lives. I needed to bring the great thing into the classroom. And so that semester and for the years and years after that, I just contemplated like what are the really big things that I want them to be thinking about? Not the 16 topics that are in the beginning of the, of the textbook, but the really big ideas and the big questions. And so I started mapping out, you know, like what really matters and so on. And uh, I won't take you through all of this. I just, I just want to give you a sense of like what I was up to. And over the years, like sure enough, the, the teaching evaluations went up, engagement went up, and I was very nearly like getting perfect scores out of 400 students. And I'm almost getting like perfect 5.0s because we're just having like such an amazing connection with each other, contemplating these big ideas. So then I decided to write a textbook about it, and, and after I wrote the textbook, I'm like, oh, this is great. Now I'm really going to be able to like, uh, give them the answers. You know, like, uh, this isn't just about inspiring questions. Now I know the answers, and of course, once I knew the answers, the <laughs> T-Vals plummeted. And, <laughs> and uh, so I really looked, I looked carefully at these T-Vals. Now, teaching evaluations, you have 400 students are long. You know, there's 21 pages here, all single-spaced. And there's some good ones in there, but I want to take you to one that really stirred me up. It's, it's quite long, um, so I'm just going to summarize it here. Basically, she said, your lectures are cliche and pretentious. You do not present the other side uh, or the dark side of the perspectives you champion. I've been planning this T-Val since halfway through the semester and revised it every so often. Like, she's taking this very seriously. Um, nothing hit me harder and made me lower the angry tone of this evaluation than during the last lecture. I know you experience the same anxieties as us. I had a good view of you from the side of the room, and I could see your hands shaking. 
I know you try. I know you care. So it's, it's like, dang it, like, this is like really harsh criticism, <laughs> and yet, uh, and yet um, also kind and, 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 and like genuine. And so I had to take it seriously. And I went through every comment on there and actually categorized them all. And I realized that the overwhelming theme of the whole thing and, and what had changed between when I was like uh, doing what I'll call great teaching and what happened in that semester. Um, essentially, I broke it down into two sections here. When I was ego teaching, that's all about the performance. Like you're worried about how people perceive you and you're performing for them. Great teaching is all about connection. You're connecting around this great thing, the great questions. Uh, ego teaching, you're focusing on yourself, how people perceive you. Great teaching, you're focusing on the event, the event of being together and contemplating these great things together. Ego teaching is draining because you're so concerned about yourself and how people are perceiving you. Great teaching is invigorating. Ego teaching is full of pain and anxiety. Great teaching offers constant forgiveness because you're, you're going after this great thing together. And ego teaching is full of judgment, not just of yourself, but you actually start judging others and you look at your students with judgment and great teaching is full of curiosity. So that when you get negative comments, uh, you don't like judge the student and say, oh, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I was actually a really great teacher. Instead, you get curious and you wonder like, well, I wonder why they would perceive me as not being great, like as not doing a good job. And you, you dig a little deeper. So as I dug deeper into those TVAL comments, I realized that what happened that semester was I thought I had all the answers, and my answers, you know, I'm, I'm fairly left-leaning, I'm progressive. Uh, my answers tend to lean toward the left, of course. Um, and so I decided that summer that I would read the right. I would read, and I would I'd read it with respect and, and empathy and try to understand where they're coming from. And when I did that, I saw their narrative, and it helped me see my own narrative. Uh, it made the great questions stand out in ways that I hadn't seen before. It revealed deeper assumptions, uh, their assumptions, but uh, my assumptions as well. I did not come to agree with people on the right, but I, did, uh, I didn't agree with my former self either, and I started living the questions again. And so I came back into the classroom sort of invigorated again, and I found the, the greatness of our disciplines, I think, uh, when you, when you find that greatness, what you find is that you actually welcome diversity of experience and thought. You welcome somebody on the right who can challenge you if you're standing on the left or vice versa. You embrace ambiguity because you recognize the inadequacy of your concepts and models. I mean, we've been talking about these great questions for thousands of years. We're not going to come up with the answers in a classroom at Kansas State University. We pursue honesty because great things demand it. We proceed with humility because it's the only posture possible. And we feel connected to something greater and to one another. I th one way of saying this uh, is, is not to say that when you do great teaching, you're giving up yourself. Uh, I think of ego teaching as really not yourself at all. It's really the coping self. It's the self that's trying to protect um, your, your ego. But when you're doing great teaching, your real self actually just kind of comes out. Uh, all of this can be found in chapter five of The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. And he has this great diagram where he talks about, um, he, he lays out the, the way that we normally think about education as we have this thing that the expert transfers to all the amateurs. And he suggests that we think about this a little bit differently and retie these strings. Put the thing at the middle and you make it a great thing. And all the amateurs around you actually come at it from a different angle. So they're not really amateurs. They all know something. We're all knowers in a sense. And we're all different. And those differences actually help us understand the great thing from many different perspectives. Ultimately, this great teaching also I think makes room for risk-taking and innovation and revitalization of yourself and your discipline. And so I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the things that have happened um, to me since I've been laying on the floor these last six years thinking about the great thing. Uh, I took those 10 big lessons that I'm trying to teach and I made a challenge for each one. And this is in the context of trying to shift my classroom into a space where we can uh, do a, a blended learning, right? It can be, have some people online and some people in class and uh, a wide mixture of different things. 
And so, for example, big idea number one is that human differences represent potential and possibility, that they're interesting, that we should open up to others. We don't have to, we don't have to be afraid of differences. And the first challenge then is to just go talk to a stranger and share their story. I started thinking about my class not as online or face-to-face, -face, but out in the world. And students could go out in the world and do these challenges. So students just would go out to a parking lot and they would meet people. And so they, uh, here's a student who met this guy on a motorcycle. And he says, what's your favorite thing about being in love with each other? And he says this. And then he starts up his motorcycle and he rides off into the sunset. Uh, he met another person in the parking lot. He said, she says, I'm pushing carts now to get in shape for my surgery. I'm donating my kidney to my sister. He says, wow, you're a hero. Uh, no, I'm no hero. Just making my world a better place like I'm supposed to do. I met Leia while she was frantically trying to save the life of a baby bird whose wings had gotten crushed by a shopping cart. And then I looked at the tattoo on her arm. It says, sisters. So every week we have new challenges and the students are going out and doing these challenges and uh, trying new things and putting the ideas into action out into the world and then sharing their pictures um, back in, on the online platform so we can actually get to know each other and build the sense of community around these great things. And then at the end they write a manifesto about how they're going to use these ideas in their life. And I'll just share one reflection from a student here just compounding these 10 challenges into eight weeks has just like super awakening and I didn't expect to be that that to happen like I'm 27 like I have gone out to the world and I have experienced things but yet still like this 200 level anthropology class has like given me like tools to sort of deal with things that I either didn't know I was still dealing with or have not dealt with completely or in a healthy fashion. So the other thing I realized uh, is that once we were freed of the classroom uh, in a traditional sense, I could actually send my TAs all over the world as well. So these are some of my TAs here. My name is Ben and I'm in Jakarta, Indonesia. Hi, my name's Matt, and I'm in Barcelona, Spain. I'm Amy, and I'm headed to Samoa. I'm Dan Wilkinson, and I'm here in Zambia. Let's go, Zambia, let's go! And then I also realized that I no longer had to be in the classroom all the time. I could travel, I could lecture from the road, and so I thought about my friends who had inspired me <laughs> to become a dad. And, uh, and Lanson is actually, my, my first son, Wilson, is named after Lanson. And so there's the three of us, and now we actually are the dads of a vast family, 17 people, and uh, our kids get to play together as I'm teaching. <laughs> when you reach a certain age and look back over your life, it seems to have had an order. They seem to have had a, a been composed by someone. And those events that when they occurred seemed merely accidental and occasional and just something that happened, turn out to be the main elements in a, in a consistent plot. Hey, guys! Hey, Daddy. You look just alike. Just as those people whom you met by chance became effective agents in the structuring of your life, so you have been an agent in the structuring of other lives. And the whole thing gears together like one big symphony. Everything influencing and structuring everything else. It's as though our lives were the dream of a single dreamer in which all the dream characters are dreaming too. It's a beautiful idea. So that's my six-year-old George, uh, the last day in the village. He's actually in the backyard trying to build a house so that we could stay forever. Uh, so obviously, like, my class as it is today is not going to be anything like your class. 
I just wanted to leave you with this idea of the great thing, that if you can center yourself on the great thing and share it with your students, I really think that's all we have to do and everything else will take care of itself. Thank you.